welcome um, to our Beyond Insurance Academy cri uh, essentials of essential elements of a crisis communication plan. Barb is back this year. He, she uh, was here last year <laughs> and did just did a, an excellent job. So we're really really happy to have Barb back. Um, you know, crises are, are happening today in businesses uh, daily. Some you hear about, some you don't. They're happening in all different types of, of entities. So this is a really good and timely topic for you to be um, part of. Uh, Barb is a uh, partner with Hennis Painter Communications Plan. Uh, communications, that one of the few uh, communication companies that's, that deals strictly with uh, crisis communication. Uh, they represent uh, many different industries, from the public sector to the private sector, and they really work with firms that are uh, on trial uh, in the court of public opinion. So she's well qualified, and I'd like you to, everybody to welcome her today. Thank you, Pat. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. Well, uh, when I was here before, we talked in general about crisis communications, and one of the questions after the presentation was um, about doing a crisis communication plan, and I made the mistake of saying that's a whole nother long discussion, and so I said, well, come back and let's do that. So I know some of you might have been here and others weren't, so I'll cover some of the basics today of crisis communications in addition to talking about uh, how to do a plan. But first of all, I just want to talk about what is a crisis because we get calls you know we do crisis communications work and we'll get calls from people sometimes and they'll say well you know I don't know if this is really a crisis and some of them clearly are um, but a lot of things that we deal in are reputational issues so a crisis is certainly a you know a show-stopping event something that um, you know draws a lot of attention but um, uh, what I want to talk about more than anything today is what works when you have a crisis, when you're facing a crisis, and then I also want to talk about even if you don't have an actual crisis, what you should be thinking about just in case it happens. Just like you have good insurance, you know, preparing for a crisis in advance is a very important thing. Now I want to say right up front, you know, I don't usually use, like to use PowerPoint because I like for the discussion, you know, if you have questions, just go ahead and ask a question and not to be tied to what's on a slide. But there's a lot of stuff covered here today, so you have a handout there, and I have some examples I want to show you. So I am using PowerPoint, but if you have questions, you don't have to wait till the end. Just stop me and we'll answer your questions as we go. I think everybody in this room knows, just from watching the news, that something bad can happen to a company, and the reputation of a very good company can be destroyed very, very quickly. And we could think of a whole lot, organization, I mean, we could think of a lot of different organizations, Penn State to BP, on and on and on, that have handled a crisis poorly, and because they handled a crisis poorly, all of their hard work over the years building their reputation uh, is destroyed. So that's what we don't want to have happen to any of you. So when you think about a crisis, for, for me, you know, yeah, it's a, it's a big event, but really, everybody in this room has a job that you go in and you do every single day, right? And when a crisis event occurs, it takes your attention off of what your daily job is and you're really spending all of your time either cleaning up after it or dealing with the impact of the crisis. So, you know, and for some of you that may be, you know, a huge thing like an explosion. For some of you it may be something much more uh, simple like planning, you know, how you're going to do your succession smoothly when something happens. So, you know, crisis covers a lot of different kinds of things depending on the size of your company, depending on the visibility of your company, uh, and all of those other things. Essentially, what are you worried about? Whatever you worry about for you, that could be a crisis. Now, we've done a lot, a lot of work in crisis and it scares people when I list all the different kinds of things we've done, but these are the kinds of things that we've done and more. You know, labor issues, layoffs few years back. You know, during the recession, it felt like we were closing plants continuously and, lay, you know, doing layoffs for companies. We've done a lot of work with organizations that have, you know, some um, non-governmental organization after them, Greenpeace, protesters, whatever, you know, boycotts, those kinds of things. Sudden leadership changes that happened maybe because of a death, maybe because, of, you know, the leader of a company was caught doing something illegal. We've had a number of those. 
natural disasters. Certainly this category here, the misconduct, the financial misconduct, sexual misconduct, we've done a lot of work, more than I care to even tell you about, uh, for schools, social service organizations that have been dealing with you know, sexual assault, sexual misconduct with children, environmental accidents, industrial accidents, OSHA investigations, EPA investigations, you name it, medical malpractice. So not to scare you, but all of those things happen to our clients all the time, and that's what we help them deal with. There's a difference between your marketing that you do for your company and what you do in a crisis situation. I came from a public relations background. In public relations and marketing, you're trying to convince people over a long period of time to change their behavior in some way, right? To buy your products, to vote for your school levy, you know, whatever it is, to become an employee. In a crisis situation, you neither have the time nor do you want the attention for that long. In a crisis situation, you want to make the story shorter, you want to make the story better, you want to make the story go away, right? The best crisis stories I have, you never heard about. And the reason you never heard about them was they didn't get the huge national attention because they were handled properly and they went away. So that's our goal in a crisis situation. So what works in a crisis situation? It's very different in the way you communicate. You have to communicate in very simple, straightforward language because if you start talking in business speak and nobody understands it, you know, it's very difficult for people to understand. People want solutions and they want specific solutions. You know, if there's a tornado that destroys your plant, people need to know, should I show up for work? Where should I go? What should I do with the delivery you've got coming tomorrow? They need somebody with some credibility and expertise. They don't want a PR person standing in front of a camera answering questions that they don't know. They want somebody who can actually give them real information. Nothing around PR people, but um, they want you to do it quickly because they don't want to wait three days to find out. But when you give them that information, even though it's quick, it has to be accurate. So if you say something wrong in front of the media or give the wrong information out there, it's going to live a long time. So you have to be accurate in what you say. Transparency is a huge word these days. We all hear this, and most of your companies are not used to being transparent, right? You don't release a lot of information. But when a crisis happens, suddenly you're being asked questions about things that you never want to talk about. But transparency gives you credibility. People trust you if you're actually open and honest with them. And the last one, compassion and concern. If there's a victim, if there's anyone harmed, and you want to show compassion and concern for that victim, it goes a long way. Now, what works in a crisis? This is our mantra. Tell the truth, tell it first, tell it all. If you don't hear anything else I say today, this is what you need to hear. And I use these three individuals to illustrate my point because I think they're perfect examples. Tell the truth. I used to use Bill Clinton for my tell the truth. Remember Bill Clinton? I did not. I have sexual relations with that woman. Remember that, right? But now I use Lance Armstrong. And the reason is because Lance Armstrong lied. And he didn't just lie once, twice, three. he lied for decades, right? And then when Lance Armstrong finally decided he was going to come clean and he sat down in the tell-all interview, right? Who believed the word he said? Did anybody in this room believe anything Lance Armstrong said? He had no credibility. So if you don't tell the truth, you lose all credibility. And then when you do tr decide, nobody believes you. So you have to tell the truth in a crisis. And then tell it first. I use our good friend Jim Trestle. Now, University of Akron loves the fact that Jim Trestle is no longer coaching football at the Ohio State University, right? But I contend that if Jim Trestle had told it first, he would still be coaching football. He would have had one bad season, maybe a couple. He would have had some, you know, sanctions, okay. But he would still be coaching because he would have come clean. Instead, he waited until someone else found out about it. Now, when you think about it, when the media finds something bad, right, they love it. It's all over the front page. It leads the evening news, right? But if you go to the media and you tell it first, or you go to your employees and you tell it first, they don't have that gotcha. So then, you know, maybe it's on the inside or on the Metro page, or maybe it's, you know, four stories down in the evening news. And then tell it all, my favorite is Tiger Woods. You remember Tiger Woods, right? So Tiger Woods has affairs, right? Well, first it comes out he has one affair, and then he doesn't say a word. And then every single day, or I don't even know how long this went on, another mistress, and then another mistress, and then another mistress, and another, remember that? And it went on and on and on, and who cared, right? So if Tiger Woods had come out first and said, yes, I had affairs, I had multiple affairs, 
you know, my wife and I are going to work on this, go away. Who would care who these mistresses were? But the story went on and on and on. And remember, the goal is to make the story shorter and make it go away. You don't want to lengthen the time of the story. So tell the truth, tell it first, tell it all. So when you think about a crisis plan, I'm going to jump now from crisis communications planning uh, to crisis communications planning. And what you need to do if you're thinking about a plan is think first about what the risks are to your particular business. What are some of the kinds of things that would happen that would be a crisis situation? And there are a couple of different categories that we think about. There are things that are happening over time that you think, you know, this could go bad, and if it happened, it would be bad. And then there are things that happen very suddenly, like a natural disaster, like an explosion, like an accident in your plant, okay? There are the likely versus the unlikely, things that you, you know, terrorist attack, maybe, but you know, if you're in certain industries, if you're in healthcare, there's a much higher likelihood that something bad could happen with one of your patients than there is that something like a terrorist attack. One of the big ones in terms of how you will be perceived is this third one, mistake versus victim. Did you or some, one of your employees make a mistake? Did you do something wrong? Or did somebody else do something wrong that led to this problem? Now, a lot of companies want to say that they're the victim when something bad happens. Companies are very rarely the victim when something bad happens within your own organization. Because even if it was one of your employees, you should have known about it. You should have done a better job of protecting. Okay? So don't think, you know, I'm the victim because one of my employees did it. Think I'm the victim because there was a tornado that came through or something that I had absolutely no control over. And then long-term impact versus passing. There are some things that will have an impact on your business for a very, very long time. BP oil spill didn't go away anytime short, and they're still fighting it in the courts. Versus something that happens very quickly, very suddenly, and you move on. So when we look at it and try to figure out what to plan for, we think about things like how likely is it to occur, because you want to plan for the ones that could actually happen. You can't plan for everything. And then you also want to think about, if it did occur, how damaging would it be? You want to kind of brainstorm and think about the ones that you're worried about and try to prioritize. Because if something is likely to occur and it would have a huge reputational damage to your business or put you out of business for a period of time, you want to have a plan for that. Now, essentially, and you know, if you look at crisis plans online, and there are all kinds of crisis communication plans online, and you could pull them up, and any one of you could do this. But I have looked at crisis communication plans that are as thick as the old phone books. Nobody uses phone books anymore, but you all remember how they used to look, right? And I have to tell you that if something bad happens, there's no way you're ever going to use that plan. If it's so thick and so complicated, forget it, because you've got to respond quickly. Because today, with social media, with 24-7 news, everything else, you've got to get something out quickly. So if you're going to put together a plan, these are the elements. Whoa, did I just, I just skip ahead? I'm using my hands and using it. <laughs> Essentially, all you need is who will say what to whom and how and when. That's it, right? Sounds easy. But that's what you need. You need to know who's going to do, do it, what they're going to say, how they're going to get the message to those people, who the priorities are, so when you're going to be able to do it, and what mechanisms are you going to use to do it. The where is kind of are we going to be you know, working from here, we're going to bring it to the plant, but that's it. So we're done. We can all go home, right? <laughs> but I think we, you probably want to know more than that. So thinking about the who. Now, most of you are fairly small businesses, right? You probably don't have a huge communications team sitting in a back room with nothing to do, and this is their priority. But the who, then, wh who in, within your organization, you want to think about who is good at communicating with which audiences, right? So think about who in your organization can handle the communications. And this is going to be a lot of your senior leadership people, but not necessarily only your senior leadership people. Because I'll, absolutely, if you have an administrative assistant who's great on the phone, that's a person you want on your team. If you've got people that are great in an emergency situation and keep their cool, put them on the team. You want to put together the best team you possibly can. You always need to have backups because that crisis isn't going to happen on a Tuesday afternoon when everybody's sitting at their desk with nothing to do. That's the one thing I've learned in all my years. They happen on holidays. They happen when the CEO is in Europe, you know, and it can't be reached. They happen when somebody's in the hospital or just had a baby. So you have to have backups for all the different people on your team. And when you build your team, 
you want to think about who's going to actually respond to the crisis. So if you're a manufacturing facility and you have a crisis on the floor, or you're a hospital and you're going to have to have people evacuating patients or a nursing home or whatever, you're going to have a part of your team that's going to do the actual operational response, right? Those same people can't be doing the communications because you need those people out there doing whatever the evacuation is, whatever that is. A lot of people, when they start to do a communications plan, they've got the operational piece in place. They know how to do that. And then they kind of add on, well, so these people will communicate. And my first question is, well, are they going to be down there in the plant, you know, working <laughs> with your, your people? Because if they're down there, they're not going to be talking on the phone and they're not going to be in front of the media cameras. So you have to think about the two. But you also have to think about this very important point here, which is the liaison between the two, because the two groups have to communicate. So when you put your plan together, you have to make sure that the people who are responding on the ground are updating the people who are talking to your employees and your, the media and all those other people, because if they don't know what's going on, they don't have anything to say. So part of your plan has to be the communications back and forth between those two groups. So, when you put your team together, you think about what the responsibilities are that you need. Who can do what? Who knows how to update your website? Because if a crisis happens, who's that person who's going to be able to work on your website? Who's the person who's going to be able to make those customer calls, talk to the media, do all those other things? Think about those. Um, think about somebody who is going to keep track of what happened. Because you're going to be so busy, you're not going to remember everybody that called. So who's going to keep a log of all the phone calls that come in so that a couple times during the day you're going to make sure those phone calls were returned? Who's the person who's going to take care of those kinds of things? Okay? And when you're going to send out an email to all of your employees or whatever, who's actually going to do that? So when you put the team together, think about those kinds of things. Now, let's talk about what you're going to say. Now, this is another one of my... Uh, uh, points that I mentioned before. So if you think about the way the media covers a crisis situation, you think about there are different frames of reference within the media. The media tells stories. The media does not just report the facts. You know, I used to be a reporter. I married to a reporter, a former reporter. Got a lot of friends who are reporters. I have never ever in my life heard a reporter say, that's very important information. We need to share that with the public. No. What does a reporter say? That's a great story, right? That's what they want, they tell stories. And they tell stories in a couple of different frames of reference. They tell stories about heroes. This guy up here is the one who helped the three women escape from the home in Cleveland, you remember that? He was a hero, he was all over the national news for days. They tell stories about honor and dishonor. We all know the guy over here with the dishonor going on. They tell what we call horse race stories during a political campaign, who's ahead, who's behind, who got a bump in the polls after the debate, who's doing what, right? It's not about the issues, it's about the horse race. Well, in a crisis situation, a crisis situation is what we call a three V's story frame. And the three V's stand for the three characters in the story. And the three characters are the villain, the victim, and the vindicator. Okay? The villain is the person who did something wrong, the victim is the person who's harmed, and the vindicator is the person who comes in to save the day. If you think about it, the simplest way to think about it is a crime story. Okay? So there's a crime, the guy who did something wrong is the, you know, the criminal, is the vic villain, the victim is the person who was harmed, and the vindicator is the person who saves the day. Now, we could go on for a long time about how the media does this, but if you all think about watching TV, watch 60 Minutes, you can tell exactly who the villain, the victim, and the vindicator are in those stories, right? The villain is always the guy with the tight frame, looking really evil, right? <coughs> the victim is sitting on the couch with her cats, her family pictures behind her, and the vindicator is the reporter coming in to save the day and tell you all about this terrible thing. So in a crisis situation, and th this is true in the Beacon Journal, this is true in you know, the local news, if you read the paper, you'll see these frames all the time. The goal in crisis communication is not to be the villain. Something bad happens in your company, don't be the villain. You're probably not the victim, you want to be the vindicator. So the idea of what you say in a crisis is to get you from that villain role into the vindicator role. Okay. Now, if you say no comment, which your lawyer might tell you to say, you're going to be a villain. You know why? Because you got something to hide, you must have done something wrong. And the only people who say no comment are people who did something wrong. So don't say no comment, you got to say something. 
So what are you going to say? What you're going to say is going to be as forthcoming as you possibly can. You're going to say as much as you can, and you're going to say it in a way, in a tone, that shows that you have compassion, and it shows that you're trying to restore confidence in the people that were harmed, the people who were affected, whatever in the situation. You want to tell people the actions you're going to take to fix it, okay? Now, messages are not facts, they're not long explanations, and we hear this all the time. Something bad happens, and I always go back, think back to the BP oil spill. You know, when the BP oil spill occurred, the media is showing pictures of, you know, people who couldn't go out on their boats because to fish their livelihood because the, there's oil in the water. Birds covered in oil, right? And who did BP put out at first? If you remember this, Rob remembers this. He, they put out engineers, and they're talking about very complicated engineering solutions to the oil, right? And nobody bought it because they just like, get the, water, get the oil out of the water, you know, we want our livelihood back. So you don't want long, complicated explanations. You also never want to blame somebody else for what's going on. Now, you can do that in court <laughs> later, but if you start blaming, and the example I always use is, the, remember the Ford Firestone case a number of years ago when there were blowouts on the cars and, and Ford manufactured the cars, Firestone manufactured the tires, and both of them spent months pointing at each other, and that story went on and on and on and on and on for months, probably for years. You don't want to blame. You also don't ever want to speculate you don't want to say, you know, I think what, this, what happened here is this because, again, we're early on. If you're wrong, it's going to come back to haunt you. You don't want to do that. And the other thing is you don't want to be self-serving. A lot of companies, when there's a crisis, want to say, well, we do great things in this community, and we give a lot of money to charity, and we employ, you know, 15,000, whatever. Nobody cares. Crisis situation, you can't be self-serving. So what are you going to say? Well, the messages are going to be things like, I'm sorry. Now, sometimes people think that saying, I'm sorry, I got Carrie up here in front, she's a lawyer, you know, is I'm sorry saying that I am responsible. No, it is not. Because you can say I'm sorry in a way that doesn't say I did anything wrong or I'm liable. You could say I'm very sorry that we have inconvenienced people. I'm very sorry that people were hurt. You could certainly say, we extend our sympathies to any of the victims. You want to show you care. Your message points have to show that you're a human being, you care about what happened. So what we put in a plan is sort of an initial statement that you could get out very, very quickly. And we would go through and we would say, what were those scenarios that you had? And what would you say if one of those scenarios occurred? And those would be your messages. And that would be the what part of your plan. And then to whom? Now, the first thing you always need, how many of you have a media policy within your company? Okay, if, a, if something bad happens, you need a media policy because who's gonna talk to the media? Let's say that your place is evacuated and your employees are standing around in the parking lot. What are the media gonna do? They're gonna show up at your place and they're gonna start talking to the people in the parking lot, right? And what are they gonna say? They're not gonna give them the accurate information, right? So you gotta have a media policy that says if the media show up, who they should talk to, who they should contact, and why. How about a social media policy? How many of you have social media policies? Okay, we got some work to do. Because what's the other thing your employees are gonna do? They're gonna pull out their cell phones and they're gonna snap pictures of what's happening, right? And they're gonna put them on Facebook and they're gonna tweet them out. And guess where the media is? The first place the media is gonna go to find out what happened at your facility. They're gonna be on Twitter and they're gonna pull up all those pictures. And if you don't have a social media policy, what are you gonna do about those employees that are doing that? And that's the information that the media is gonna get. So you want, a, you want a policy that says if something happens, if the media calls, here's who they should talk to, you are not authorized, here's what you should do, okay? And you wanna make sure that everybody knows exactly how to handle that media call. And if there's something that you're gonna do in terms of, you know, of approving those statements, if you got another person on staff who's writing them, Who's gonna approve them? Maybe you want your lawyer to look at them. Maybe you want the CEO to look at them. Maybe you want the owner of your company, whoever it is. Put it all down in writing because once the crisis happens, here's what happens in a crisis situation. There are some people in your organization who will freeze. They will do nothing because they'll be worried about doing anything wrong. There'll be other people in your organization who will wanna be helpful and they'll jump in and they'll start doing things. The problem is 
Some of them will do things that they have no business doing, and they'll think they're being helpful, right? But if you have a plan in place, you can clearly say, Terry, you're going to take care of calling all the employees. Let's see your name. Sandy, you're going to be our media spokesperson. I'm going to put you out in front of camera. Carrie, you're going to go back and you're going to talk to all those vendors that we need to talk to, okay? Everybody's got a place to do. Then they know what they're doing and they're not going to stand out. And Carrie's not going to get in front of the media when she's, that, that's not her job. Training your spokesperson, great idea to do media training because it's really different to stand in front of a TV camera than it is to talk to anybody else. That's a good thing. Okay, so what else? Because a lot of people in a crisis think only about the media. Oh my God, Channel 19's here. What are we going to do, right? Well, but think about, you've been in business for many, many, many years. How important is Channel 19 to you compared to your customers? Really? I mean, your customers are the most important audience, right? You care about Channel 19, but you really need to tell your audience, your uh, customers. Your employees, they're the ones that everybody else is going to ask. They're going to see them in the grocery store on Saturday and say, I hear this terrible thing happened to your company. What happened? You need to tell them what happened, because they're going to be out there talking about it, right? Maybe elected officials, you know, maybe the mayor is going to get a call if it's a big enough I issue, and you're, especially if you're in a smaller community. Mayor may need to know. You know, your council person may have just done you a huge favor by helping you get, you know, uh, something that you needed, you know, so you need to talk to those people. And then what about neighbors? Because if something happens that your neighbors have to leave, or there are a lot of trucks blocking their entryways, whatever, you want to think about your neighbors. So who needs to hear directly from you? Which brings us then to the how. And the how is really, you know, this is something you don't want to try to be thinking about on the day that the crisis occurs. We've had clients that come in with something, you know, huge. We had a food recall a number of years ago, and, you know, it's a Saturday, because as I said, they don't happen on Tuesday afternoon. So how are you going to recall this product? You need to know how to reach all of your customers on a Saturday afternoon, because you've got to get that product off the shelves right away, right? So how are you going to do it? And, you know, there's the media. You're going to do a press conference. You're going to bring them in. How are you going to handle that? The web and social media are huge right now. How many of you have Facebook and Twitter accounts for your companies? You know, that's a great way to get information out quickly and interact with people if you have it. Problem is, if you don't have it, somebody else will set it up, right? And they'll start talking about you, and that's a big problem. So you probably want to go in and get a page established just in case. You could do certainly phone calls because if, you've got, if you're a smaller company and there are only a handful of people, you could set up a phone tree and start calling your customers. That's certainly a way of doing it. Notifications, some larger companies will have reverse 911 or text capabilities. Schools are doing this now to the shootings of Virginia Tech. You know, we can text all of, our, all of our students and tell them not to come to campus. That's a great way of doing it. Now, a lot of people, especially your employees, aren't going to give you their cell phone numbers because they don't want you to call them on Saturday afternoon and call them into work, so you might not uh, get that. But there are a lot of other ways. We used to set up a lot of hotlines. A lot of companies still do that. You know, if something happens, you tell your employees, here's the hotline number, you call, we'll leave updated messages on this phone line, you can find out when you're coming in, if it's, you know, safe to come to work, all those kinds of things. You want to make sure that you maintain logs on all of the calls and things that come in, particularly for media, because if something big happens, you get a lot of media attention. You want to pay attention to who's coming in. But you want to make sure that you take care of your local media, because long after the big guys leave town, they're still going to be here covering you, OK? Yeah. Provide uh, after hours contact. Again, you've got to tell people where you're going to be, so don't go home and, le and leave and not tell people how to reach you. And then this last one is really important, the instructions for the front office staff. If you have any kind of a facility where the media could show up and walk in the door with cameras running, that person that sits there and lets people in is your most important person. You know why? Because if the media walk in and that person panics, that's the video that the media is going to show over and over and over and over and over, right? So you train that person what to say, who to call, how to handle it. You don't have to put your spokesperson up there. In fact, don't put your spokesperson up there. Just have somebody there that's ready and polite and ready to take the media when they come in. These are some examples of what some companies have done. I use these. You know, these are websites. So this was, this was the theaters after the, uh, the uh, shootings at the Aurora, Colorado. You remember when people went in during the Batman movie and were killed? So they just took over their website. 
and they put this as their front page on their website and they kept updating it over time. A great way to do it, you know, just put your information. Or if you have a news section of your website, you could certainly put your statements there. It'll save you a lot of time uh, answering media calls. This was Chobani, they had a product recall. This is their Facebook page. And what you could see is they put up their information and then people keep coming on and, and responding to it and they tell them, they clarify the information. Now the nice thing about social media is it's an interaction. So a client or a uh, person comes on and asks you a question, you could respond. It's a great way of dealing with a crisis situation. You're also gonna get criticized though. You're gonna get negative comments and you can't just take them down. So you have to be, uh, you gotta have a thick skin if you're gonna do it this way. This is JetBlue, I don't know if you remember this, they had a pilot that was taken off of a plane who had a mental breakdown. And the, the thing I liked about this was they did their regular updates on one side of the page and then they had a Q&A on the other side. So as people were asking them questions, as the media were asking them questions, they kept updating the Q&A, new information, great way to provide updates on a periodic basis. So this is really, in essence, what we talked about, what we need. There are a couple of things in here that I didn't talk about a lot. Protocols and procedures, you know, if you feel in your company that certain people have to review things, you wanna nail that down in your plan. If you feel like something has to go to your lawyers, you wanna make sure the people who are providing information. If I'm writing, you know, updates to your customers and you don't want it sent out until Tim looks at it, put that in your plan because people need to know that. Um, the pre-approved messages, you know, when you identify the things that keep you up at night, Start thinking about what you would say and get them ready and have that initial statement ready so that if you hit a crisis situation, you've got something that people are comfortable with, that the lawyer has looked at, that everybody's okay doing. Now the fourth, or the one, two, three, four, the fifth one, the stakeholders and the contact information. This is one of those things that gets everybody stuck in a crisis situation. So okay, I know I need to tell my customers. I know I need to tell, how am I gonna reach all of my employees, you know? Do I have all of those lists? And by the way, what if you can't get into your office? Because what if it was a tornado? Or what if the power is out and you can't use your, you know? So who has that information? And where is it backed up? And how will I have access to that? And think of all those different stakeholder groups. Do you know how to reach the mayor on a weekend if he's one of your stakeholders? Do you know how to reach your employees when they're not in the office? Do they only have, you know, is all you have their work email address? Because they don't check their email that often. Um, and if you have, I put instructions for activating notification, but also what are the logins for all those social media sites and who has those? Because if you only got one person in your office who does your web updates, I guarantee that person's not gonna be reachable when you need them. So who else has it? How are you gonna do that? Who's gonna log on and what, what is that information? It's a lot, it's a lot. It's a lot to think about. And then after it's all over, we like to do an evaluation. You know, what worked, what didn't work, what do we need to change in our plan, what could we have done better? Did our technology work? You know, do we need a better wireless system in that particular building? You know, do we need more phones? What do we need? Think about it so you could do it again. Um, who were the, you know, who should we train? Should we have a different spokesperson? Do we have a trained spokesperson? What kind of things should we be thinking about? And then after you do all that, you go back through your plan again and you update it. And I have just thrown so much information at all of you in such a quick period of time. But this is something that you don't, you know, what you need to do is just start thinking about these things. I mean, obviously, crisis plans, you know, big companies have these and they update them every year and they're very expensive and pretty elaborate. Smaller companies, I mean, I think if you just get started and you start thinking about the, you know, who, what, when, how, just start thinking about those things. You'll make a lot of progress just down the line of, of what you should be doing and what you shouldn't be doing. Um, so I, I wanted to leave a fair amount of time for questions because I'm assuming that what I threw at you is pretty overwhelming. So I wanted to give you time to ask me questions about it and we can talk more about it. Yes, Tip. You know, uh, everything that you address is from our company. I mm -hmm. guess my question is pretty simple and pretty basic, and I think I already know the answer, but a lot of us are probably involved in, in volunteering yeah. uh, in, within different uh, nonprofits, uh, different organizations, and so forth, and pretty much everything that you have laid out here that we can
can address from a company standpoint, we can also take to those organizations. Absolutely. And be ready to do the same thing as there. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And actually, we do a lot of work with nonprofits. And we do a lot of work. We've done crisis plans for some very small nonprofits, actually, but a lot of larger uh, organizations. Nonprofits actually have a lot more vulnerabilities in many ways than many companies because they have smaller staffs, because of the kinds of populations they serve. You know, usually, I mean, if you're serving a vulnerable popula population, children, you know, older adults, you know, people with disabilities, you're really vulnerable to a crisis situation. And so a lot of those nonprofits really need to be thinking about these things. But yeah, everything here would apply to a nonprofit. Um, the one thing we always tell nonprofits, and actually this works for every company as well, but in your crisis plan, think about which outside resources you can tap, whether it's board members, whether it's companies like ours, you know, a lot of nonprofits in their insurance, and Pat knows better than I, schools many times will have in their insurance plans that they can hire a crisis firm if something bad happens. We got hired through several, uh, for several colleges through those kinds of provisions. So, uh, so explore those things ahead. But yeah, if you're on the board of a nonprofit, thinking about that ahead is, is very good. And uh, we've helped a lot of nonprofits put them together. We, and we've mentored nonprofits through doing it because they don't have the money to pay for it. So we've kind of you know, helped them figure it out do a peer review, tell them what else they need, and kind of help them get through that process. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Barb, mm -hmm. a question that maybe others have on, on their minds is, you know, the cost mm -hmm. to put something like this together. Mm -hmm. If we were to, you know, engage someone like you, I mean, you, there'd be a, probably a lot of work that we do on our end first, but yeah, to and engage you to help because I can tell you we're all running businesses right. for the most part, and we probably have very little of any media training. Yeah. We would probably be like, wow, we, what do we say? What yeah. Do we do? So and <coughs> it's really hard for me to tell you how much a crisis plan would cost because it depends on the size of what you do. Um, I mean, we've gone as low as 20000 we've gone as high as 100000 depending on the company. Now, the 100000 ones are the big internationals, you know, where they've got a lot of facilities and and uh, and as I said we've also mentored you know some through this process as opposed to charging we charge an hourly rate for that but uh, media training is less if you only want the media training so we're you know if you want to call me or give me a card and we could talk about what it would be for your particular organization I'm happy to do that um, but the more work you do obviously the more uh, you'll save on the plan I mean but there are parts of it that I think a lot of companies like, uh, particularly the what to say. The messaging part of it tends to be the bulk of a, a plan because, you know, we used to do plans. I've been in this business a long time. The media used to be, you know, a couple times a day. So something happened, you had radio on the hour, you had TV a couple times a day, and you had newspapers the next day. So you had some time. So you got a problem, we'll sit down, we'll spend a couple hours, we'll get it right, we'll figure out what to say. Well now, what I'm finding, is that something bad happens and it's already on the website before the company, before the media even calls you. Or your employees are sending it out there and you're expected to have information immediately and that's why we do the messaging ahead. Because you need to say something, you know? And so by the time you, you figure it out and you got all your facts and you write your statement and you figure out who your spokesperson is and you, you know, you're talking way too long today. So that's why we try to do the the, even if it's just a very quick, you know, here's all I can tell you and I'll get back to you in an hour. Um, but having something in advance is really, really helpful. So, uh, but because that's the bulk of it, it's hard for most companies to do that on their own. And so there is expense uh, with that. We don't give our services away, but, but we try to work with people to, to get what they need. You know, I feel very strongly about this. So. We probably could charge a whole lot more. And honestly, when I go to a nonprofit, it's like, you really need this. Let's figure out how to help you get it. So, so when you think about, I mean, I, I know many of you don't use social media, but do you have ways already that you're reaching? I mean, you probably have ways that you're already reaching out to your customers and your employees and other people. You know, thinking about what you already have in place and what you could use in the event of a crisis, I think is really, really helpful. You know, I, depending on what kind of business you have, I didn't go through the, the when so much, but you always want to prioritize who needs to know first. You know, so if you're, 
customers are the most affected or if your employees are the most affected, you kind of want to do a little bit of a, like for example, you never want to tell other people before you do a job you know, reduction in force. You always want to tell your employees first if you're laying people off. So tell the employees, tell whoever needs to know. If something bad happens, who's affected? If it affects your neighbors, tell them first, then tell your employees. Uh, but you also need to try to get stuff out as quickly as you possibly can so people are hearing it close to at the same time, which is kind of tricky. Uh, I'd just like to hear your opinion on uh, how Chris Christie handled that crisis. I, having had you here yesterday, or last year, and then seeing that experience, I thought, for me, I thought he handled that pretty well from trying to tell the truth, getting it all out. Yeah. So I'm just curious. As to yeah, that press conference was interesting, and it was a marathon, which I'm not sure. I can't remember how long you stood up there and talked. I think Chris Christie's biggest problem is, is going to be credibility because, um, you know, I talked about blame. You know, he kept saying, you know, I'm, I'm in charge. I take full responsibility, yada, yada, yada. And then he also kind of talked about, well, this person, and I didn't know anything, and she knew, and he knew. And so I think, you know, longer term, he's going to have a little bit of a credibility issue with that. I mean, honestly, what could make people more upset than <laughs> sitting in traffic for, you know, so, so the whole issue of that was part of the problem because people were so angry and, you know, you heard these issues of, you know, school buses where the kids were two hours late for school or whatever. So, you know, I just think that's the kind of thing that his credibility, if he actually didn't know, which is still, we're still not sure about that. Um, he did, a, he did a good job with handling that initial press conference and being forthcoming and transparent. I just don't know if he was telling the truth. Mm -hmm. We'll find out, I suppose. There are all kinds of investigations on that. I mean, he's a master communicator. He really is. He's very good. You put him up in front of the microphone and he does it. He didn't lose his temper. Usually he does, so that was good. But, um, you know, he did, a, he did a nice job. I just don't know if when the truth comes out, if, yeah, we can really believe him. Of course, I tend to be a little skeptical about politicians on both sides, so, you know, who, who can we believe and who can't we? Yeah? Does your firm do strictly spokespersons training, or do you use another firm for we do. We do the training, yeah. We do a lot of that kind of training, yeah. When the way we do media training, and actually, I say media training, but it really works for training for anything. I mean, we've trained people, we've trained people to do depositions, we've trained people to do, you know, employee meetings where they're standing up answering questions or town hall meeting kinds of things. It's really presentation, how you answer questions, and uh, we videotape, play it back, practice until you get it right. What are the messages? How will you present it? We do a lot of that work. We have a guy that, uh, spent a lot of years in TV, and he's a really good trainer. Actually, we've got a number of people in TV, but Carrie's seen him at work, so. That's awesome. <laughs> if you're interested in that training, it is quite an experience. And actually, I, mean, I really do think it works for whatever you're doing. You know, if you just need help in your uh, ability to stand in front of a group of people and answer questions, it's very helpful. Did I overwhelm you? I'm not getting many questions back here, so I'm wondering if I'm, uh, maybe the amount of information or... Uh, have you, uh, do any of you have, yeah? Um, you've got a number of clients here that, like you said, are small businesses yeah. and don't have a large staff to be able to work right. with a client like that. Do you have maybe just some suggestions of, of where to start, maybe a top five, what I would do you know, just to get started, to yeah. prioritize? I mean, I honestly think that one of the, the biggest jobs is collecting your lists of people and thinking through who you would have to talk to and how you would reach them. So I think that's a top thing. So do you know how to reach employees and customers and vendors and all those different groups? And some of you have, I mean, I assume there might be some nonprofits where you'd have donors or where you'd have um, even families of employees. Would you know how to reach those people? That's a huge job. And if you do that, that helps you a lot with how you would reach it. I think thinking about what you're most worried about helps because if you start thinking about what kinds of scenarios you might have. That will help you at least to start thinking about how you would prepare. And by the way, I just made the assumption that you all have operational crisis emergency response plans. Do all of you have those? You don't have those? Okay. 
So, you know, something bad happens, what are you going to do? And maybe that's a place to start thinking about it. You know, it, it, some of these are, you know, what would you do if you could, didn't have access to your facility? What would you do if, you know, I mean, some of you are already doing some of these things, but if there was an emergency, if there was a tornado, if there was, you know, some of those kinds of operational crises, a fire, whatever. Um, and then sort of piggybacking on those with what you would say in those kinds of cases. But if you don't even have that, that may be a place to start as well. We don't do that kind of work. There are a lot of companies that do that to assess your risks and help you figure out how to plan for those. I put this up here. We do a uh, crisis communications e-newsletter that goes out a couple times a month. And it's, it's not a sales job. It's actually about crisis communications. So if you're interested in this area and you would like to be on the e-news, you probably get it, Carrie. Thank you. Um, if you, it, by the way. Thank you. I just wanted me to tell you that. Okay, good. <laughs> but if you'd like to be added to that, if you give me a business card, we'll add you to the e-newsletter. If you're not interested in it or it doesn't apply to you, just shoot me back an email and we will take you off that list. It's not, uh, certainly not obligatory. I also have these, which I've given out before. These are for, um, you know how lawyers give you the, if you get stopped for DUI, you know, call me. Well, these are, if you get it uh, accosted by a member of the media, here's what you do. So these have little tips on how to handle a media interview, what to do. And I will pass these around as well if you would like them. You can just pass them down the tables. And, uh, and if you want more, let me know. I'll, I'll have them with me. Anything else you want to ask me about any of the cri other crises besides Chris Christie? I'd be happy to tell you what I think. <laughs> I mean, I really think that one of the biggest problems that companies and organizations have when a crisis happens is that they don't communicate openly and quickly. And that's why they look like they're hiding, you know? And I, th I mean, to me, Penn State is one of the classic cases. Penn State had to know that was coming. You know, they had a grand jury interviewing the top administrators of that college. So they knew that something could happen. And yet, when it did happen, they had no plan. They didn't know what they were going to do with Joe Paterno, whether they were going to fire him or keep him on. They didn't know who was going to speak. They didn't know what they were going to say. They hadn't thought of any of those different things. And so they were caught flat-footed throughout. Had they responded quickly, you know, things would have gone much differently. I mean, that was a terrible situation no matter what. But just communicating better, I think, would have made a huge difference in the way they would have been perceived. So it makes a big difference. You have to ha first you have to do the right thing, and then you have to talk about it appropriately. So, no more questions? Oh, okay. I just really like um, how you gave us the first three, what works in a crisis, like you were just saying, tell the truth, tell it first, and tell it all. I think that most of the time what we want to do is we just want to run from it yeah. um, and not say anything because we don't know what to say. But if we're prepared, tell the truth, tell it first, and tell it all, I think that that's just that's a good um, plan just to have in everyday life. And, you know, mm -hmm. um, as long as what you're going to say isn't going to incriminate yourself. <laughs> well, it, it is interesting because the first reaction is, well, maybe nobody will find out. Uh -huh. And so people don't want to be out talking about it. And I hear that all the time. Well, why would I tell them if they're not going to maybe find out? Well, first of all, with social media today, mm -hmm. people are going to find out. But secondly, if I tell them, the example I always use for that is, uh, and some of you heard this before, but you know I have four sons, and they're not angels, believe it or not. And Tim knows they're not angels. So um, <laughs> Tim's son and my son are best friends from way back, so he knows this. So if my son comes home from school and he tells me, you know, I got a fight in the, in the playground at lunchtime, I will sit and I will listen to my son and tell him what happened, right? If my son comes home from school and he goes out and plays football and the principal calls me and says your son got in a fight on the playground. When my son comes home, I don't even care what he has to say, right? I know what happened, and he can tell me anything he wants, and I don't care. He's in big trouble. And it is the same way in a crisis situation, right? You could go out, and the media finds out, and they tell the story, and then you try to explain. But all anybody hears is what they hear first. They hear the media's version of that story. So you could say whatever you want, and you're defending. If you tell them first, they hear your side of it, maybe they still aren't quite sure but they're probably going to believe more of what you say than they will if they hear it first from the media, if they see it on Facebook, 
you know, if they hear about it from somebody else. Or they, or, and you know this with your own employees. If you tell your employees what's really going on and they hear it from you, you know, they're going to believe some of what you say. If there are all kinds of rumors within your company, by the time you actually decide to tell them what's going on, half the time they don't even really listen to you because they think they already know and you're hiding something from them, right? So it works. I mean, it's counterintuitive, though, and that's why I started with the whole crisis versus regular PR, because it is totally counterintuitive. Nobody thinks, why would I do that? But it does work. <coughs> Barb, thank you very much. Sure. You know, just once again, just a lot of that's great information, and uh, it just gives us a lot to think about. But more importantly, can we just take one or two things and act on them. Just get started if it's identifying who it is on your team and begin the discussion and brainstorm. What are our greatest risks? What could really impact our business? And start having that that conversation. And then if you get hung up, you can contact us. Contact Barb, who's definitely an expert in this. I'm sure we'll have some conversations with with Barb about this because it's really important. And what we're dealing with here, I think, mostly, and you said it right at the beginning, is your reputation. We don't we don't think about that in business because we're out trying to sell a product, serve our customers, you know, grow our business, take care of our employees, have a great place to work. But if something goes wrong, we don't think about that reputation that we've been doing and building all those years, and it could be gone in an instant. I think that's you said that right up front. I thought that was really, really important. That that's what we're trying to manage here, along with other aspects of our business. But thank you very sure. much. Once again, it's excellent. And, and again, I hope it was helpful. And if you would like to be on the newsletter list, just give me a card or write your name and email on a piece of paper and give it to me. So thank you very much. I appreciate it very much.